Dun, 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 dun. Thanks for being here. I love you all. God bless and welcome. I've talked about the sun and its flares, and I think it's an important topic. I mean, we're always looking at history so that we can understand the present, ultimately. What's going on here, really? Now, most of you know that I don't believe we're flying through space at a million miles an hour. I don't believe the Earth is spinning at 2,000, give or take. All ridiculous. But I have been following the solar cycles, getting a lot of my information from this site, and I can put aside my differences and explore their data. And here we can see a massive eruption of solar flares. It's been going on for days. This is showing May 8th, May 9th, May 10th, but it's just been ongoing. And we can see here, they say, are we experiencing a Carrington-class sunspot? In the Carrington event, we are told, happened in in 1859. And I'm very suspect of the idea that they're measuring such things in this time period. The idea that they're doing anything substantial based on the photographic evidence. But nevertheless, they tell us there was this huge event in 1859 and it lit up the sky like a light bulb even at night. Again, uh, insight into the truth of our cosmology. Lit up the dome. And we're told it knocked out the telegraph. That's what we would have had as the telegraph system in 1859 sent surges of electricity through the lines, in my opinion, the inherited lines, and the old world. And I think their story, and history in general, is a half-truth. It's like all the old history is true to some extent, with a heavy skewing of the timeline, of course, seeming up to a thousand years of distortion, but nonetheless half-truths, and we're told of this event in 1859. So this, to me, may be, in a half-truth way, the event, the event that took out the old world. Now, I've discussed before, there have been several of these events, and it seems like this cycle of reset and repopulation is ongoing. Of course it would be. And we see evidence of flooding, and we see evidence of heat, fiery, electrical discharges. And there's many ways this could be accomplished, both natural and unnatural. But in my opinion, this is the best culprit, the sun. Not millions of miles away, but very local. And same with these luminaries moving in on it, coincidentally squeezing it, increasing the magnetic field. Here it is. And it's such luminary events coinciding like this every 100 or 200 years. The reset is too massive to be pulled off by individuals. Yes, it is hastened after by controlling groups who must understand these cycles and prepare themselves for it. It would seem logical that the closer we get to one of these cycles, the people in control just kind of drop the ball. And we're in a drop the ball period right now. I mean, it just seems like they just don't give a damn um, and maybe they know the gig's up, but I don't care, really. I mean, I don't blame those in such positions. It's just their experience, and we're all having our own experience. For the most part, I found that we are free to live our lives how we choose. The struggle is more internal, deviating from the norm and our conditioning, but I think we're free, and I think our true freedom first reveals itself when we stop blaming others. As long as we blame others, we give our power away. So right now, five CMEs, or coronal ejections, are heading for Earth. And they call it a cannibal, because one will swallow up another one, and merge into a massive beast. And again, I've been following this 
I don't know, maybe for 30 years. Been a subject on Coast to Coast AM, the Art Bell Show, originally. And even though the masses really still don't know anything about this, it's been on the table all this time, and it's understood that these essentially electrical discharges threaten the power grid, and essentially all technology. There is the potential for such a shockwave that it creates a electromagnetic pulse and essentially cooks components of electronics, computers, and the grid, the transformers, all dealing with magnets and magnetic fields. And yesterday, my town lost power. At home, I didn't lose power because I'm off the grid. I have all solar. But I was at the laundromat, and just as I pulled my clothes out of the dryer, power went out, and I folded in the dark and was very grateful that the timing was perfect. I should get a washer and dryer one day. At least a washer. But nonetheless, this was normal to me. It was expected. When I worked at the hospital, I worked in the electrical department. And at six in the morning, I came in and said, we've had a massive X flare. We might lose power. And he and the other co-worker laughed. And within an hour, the power had shut down. Our backup generators kicked on. And thus far, everything has been okay. Little things like that. Just adding real-time proof that this is true. Again, I've told you in the past that I get headaches. And I'm not a big headache person. And there's just kind of this heavy energy. Also, the wind. The wind. I'm sure most of you have experienced the wind. By now it will have been last week, but it's been heavy. And there are electromagnetic forces at work here. This realm is an electromagnetic machine. We've looked at the work of David Lapointe in the resetting of his device. We've also discussed the work of Walter Russell and his free energy device. And even FPV Angel and their group have done a great job decoding what very few people are talking about the true nature of this realm construct. So I think I'll pause and we'll look at something else. Of course, I don't know anything. I just want to stress that. But what about our history? I mean, where does it really come from? We have all the books that have survived. Many were rewritten, reproduced, and many are lost and rediscovered such as The Book of Giants, a fascinating book. I was just thinking about the book. And then Glenn at Flatwater put out a great video on The Book of Giants, and I think it's very important. But it might be a little too removed for most, not myself. But here, Chris at Old World Exploration made a video titled Writing History, showcasing this man responsible for writing much of the Western North American history, Hubert Howe Bancroft. I kind of want to show you what they do. I mean, here we can see when we type in his full, long, stupid name, he shows up. But how about if we just typed in Bancroft? Surely this man who wrote North American history should pop up immediately, even if we just put in his last name. Let's delete the first part and search. Here we go. Now this is something that they do. I don't know how many times I've searched for something that should be very important, and it's political polluted with something else, something that has hijacked what should be very important. And here we go. Some TV show, we scroll, we scroll, we scroll, just garbage. Like, who is Bancroft? Let's see if they suggest them, even. Mm, I don't know. Not quite his full name even suggested down here. So there we go. Now let's go back. Hubert Howe Bancroft. And as always, I suggest you watch Chris's video. It will be more in-depth than what I share here. But old Hubert. Ah, uh, yes. Born in 1832. A fine mustache. And a very gentle yet distant gaze. Nice clean suit. And head of hair. An American historian and ethnologist. Namesake of the Bancroft Library, University of California, Berkeley. He wrote and published and collected works concerning the Western United States, Texas, California, Alaska, Mexico, Central 
Central America and British Columbia. He's from Ohio. He was a clerk in his brother-in-law's bookstore in Buffalo, New York. His first jobs. Then he moves to California. I mean, really, to move to California in 1852 from Buffalo. How much money did you save at this bookstore? I mean, realistically, it should read he bought a horse and wagon, almost died. I mean, really, look at the Mormons. Or the Donner Party, for that matter. It's no joke getting from one side of the country to the other. It's hard to get out of your state in a car, let alone six or seven. So he moves to California. He was provided with an inventory of books to sell and was sent to the booming California city of San Francisco. So San Francisco begins in 1849. I mean, there's nothing there. If we read San Francisco history, it burns down four or five times. There's no city. There's no order yet. But no, he just moves and brings a bunch of books and an inventory. So just complicating things. Brings these crusty books. I mean, what condition are they in? By the time he makes it across the country. How many rainstorms? How much mud kicked up by the horses? Anyway, he just arrives to San Francisco, a brand new city. And we know better. We know it was there. But let's just suspend our knowledge. We're told he sets up a regional office. And now we're told it's his company. That's it. So somebody just gave him this. And now it's his successful company. Entering the world of publishing in the process. That's it. He's... He's 20. <laughs> he's 20. He's born in 1832. This is 1852. 20-year-old. He gets these books, sets up an office in San Francisco that is at its infancy. I mean, how did he get a building and now he has a printing press? He's publishing books? He became a serious collector of books, building a collection numbering in the tens of thousands. In 1868, he resigned from his business and abandoned everything to to devote himself entirely to writing and publishing history. So this is already stupid. Why are you writing history? I mean, you should be documenting or researching and then publishing. But no, he's writing and publishing history. He may be responsible for his very own historical narrative. This stupid story. He developed a plan to publish a history in 39 volumes from the Pacific coast of North America, Central America to Alaska. He employed writers and wrote some of the material himself. I mean, come on. And he is a official primary source of history and he's just outsourcing it there we go and actually it makes perfect sense because we know the truth or at least see the bigger picture if you have an entire built-out city such as san francisco again there are hundreds of examples of buildings that are clearly older than 1849 and even more examples of photographs of buildings that have been torn down and if you were inheriting a city you will need to rewrite a history and here is the man given credit but i think it's even deeper i don't even think this man exists but yet we're being told we're being given a distraction ploy technique here being fed a man and a mustache and impossible feats responsible for doc documenting our history. And the first inclination would be to blame this man and say he is full of it. But the truth is this man doesn't exist, in my opinion. He is simply the figurehead. And none of this rewriting, in my opinion, would begin until the early 1900s. This is still too early to even be thinking about writing history. Everybody in this time period will have been busy with basic survival. There's no bookstore in San Francisco in 1852. This man is a fake. This is not a photograph from 1852, but more realistically as late as the 1930s. So let's look at one more thing. I am a YouTube junkie. It's pretty much all I do, just watch YouTube videos. Fortunately, I live in nature and will often just walk out the back door after an overdose of technology. Just walk out the back door with Chief and go on a hike at least four times a day. 
A dog reminds you of what is real. If you get overly mental, they will insist that you snap out of it. And I think I'll always have a dog. I always have, since I was 14. I think it's a good feature. Something that becomes a part of you, and you of it. If I didn't live off the grid, by now, I would most certainly begin. I would probably do exactly what I did before. Just buy a cheap piece of land, move a camp trailer on it, and start building a house. You can avoid even getting a permit by building several small houses. In my county, you can build a 12 by 12 structure without a permit. It just makes me sick. I built my house for $15,000, my new one. You can still buy a piece of land for $10,000 somewhere around you or within 100 miles. And in my opinion, this is how it's meant to be. We're not supposed to be at the mercy of the economy or people making bad decisions. Henry David Thoreau used to look at the little buildings next to the train tracks, little utility buildings, and think how perfect how he could live in one of those. And eventually would for a couple years. He would build his own. And I've been living out here for 20 years. I don't think I'll fare that well if there was a reset. I think the key is to be underground. In my book, Off Grid, that I wrote in 2012 or 13, I talked about an underground house. Now that's my dream house. And after doing this research, I realized that's the only type of house that you want. And I think that's how those in control today and their ancestors may have risen to power so quickly and been able to seize control of this unfortunate circumstance. And if I could somehow, I would take a little peek at the subway system in St. Petersburg, and also Moscow. The subway system looks more like a palace, the most beautiful columns ever, often made of glass or a glass covering. And in my opinion, it is pretty clear that people were living down here. This is not the type of decor necessary for a subway system. And many of these were recently unveiled, not even open to the public. And then suddenly they just open them. They say for many years, the train would pass through this section while it was under construction. And we see this everywhere actually. I mean, I've discussed it even with the World's Fairs and other monumental buildings. We often have a subway passing under it, and in fact, these monumental buildings are oftentimes simply the hubs or the terminals. And could this all have been part of the old world? Of course it was. These glorious cities with underground trains and these beautiful buildings. This video showed a lot of them. I mean, just mind-blowing. And when we look underground, it's even more monumental of a feat to accomplish. So unbelievable that there's no way that we come in and do any of this after the matter. This is all original. Here we can see this terminal for example, with all this marble. And here's the building that sits on top of the terminal. I thought we would look at some screenshots. It's stupid, I take so many screenshots. And what's the point if I don't share them? So let's have a look. Here was one of the terminals this girl shared above this beautiful subway. You can see it behind her. And here's the building we get on top. So you see this is much more than just random building, random building. Often these will be repurposed. And yet there was a whole underground network. Here again, one of the triumphal arches outside one of these subway stations. And these are the ruins of a giant. The giant is called Og, and these are all stones, and in my opinion, just cooked out. And this is biblical. I mean, the Bible talks about Og and his kingdom and how it was destroyed. Og was a giant in Israel in biblical times. There's some videos out there showing an archeologist going in here, going underground. This looks like a cooked out dome. And he goes in here and it's all blockage. Again, heavily damaged, but yet historically, 
It is absolutely understood to be Og the Giant's ruined kingdom. This is some meltage shared by our melted reality, Mark. And what can I say, really? This is a great picture, and he shows hours and hours of examples like this. My favorite, the transitioning of brick and block to stone. This is another great example by another channel that he shared, and I believe this was in Arizona. Just mind-blowing. I should have taken a dozen screenshots of this place. And we can see like a little fusion of the once existing turrets now blocking up. And he picked up on the Roosevelt Dam and really showed some great examples, pushing the research forward on this subject. And we can really get a good look at this structure over here, which is the one that really interests me, almost resembling Petra in Jordan. And what I discovered is a lot more ruins further upstream from the dam, just unnoticed. But this is good. This is really, really good evidence. This really reminds me of the ruins I discovered in Provo Canyon, the old hydroelectric plant over there. Well, this is essentially the same thing, and in my opinion, the same era. We see the old ruined dam covered with a modern facade. And here, once again, a little closer. You can see the condition of the blocks, some looking better than other parts. And what can I say? Look at this old worlder back here. I'm surprised they didn't just cover this with concrete too. But many stages, again, in my opinion, we're still seeing two different stages showing that the dam is even older than the blockage. Two different resets here. Three, if we consider the refacing of the dam. This was a really good share I took a screenshot of. This is way up on a mountain top. I think, no doubt, a pocket of survival. The blast must have come from the other side. Or the cavity helped cool it enough. Enough cool air in here to preserve this little chunk. And here again, we can see it from afar. Everything kind of becoming obvious these days. The more people that share. And this was a picture or video that I took a screenshot of, taken by Emily Suzanne. Always a great provider of first-hand boots on the ground. And what is this thing, really? That's all. Really seeming like a projection. I noticed in 2013 that the moon, in particular the man on the moon, that had always sat in the same fixed position, began to roll. And recently someone shared a channel, Catfish Corner, I think. And he has confirmed this, he and many other channels, that the moon is actually doing a cartwheel and changes position and orientation throughout its cycle. Something it didn't use to do. So let me know your thoughts. That was a lot. I hope you enjoyed. I love you all. God bless. And I'll see you next week.